Good evening. Welcome to the Boyden Library for our final presentation in this spring's Boyden Library Author Series. Uh, while this is the last event in our spring author series, we will have two programs coming up in June. On June 2nd, <coughs> 7 p.m. Kevin Gardner, author of The Granite Kiss, will present a program on the traditions and techniques of building New England stone walls. And Kevin will be constructing a tabletop stone wall during the course of his talk. <laughs> Mr. Gardner's appearance is jointly sponsored by the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, and the Boyden Library. And Kevin Rogers of the Friends of the Boston Harbor Islands that will be here on June 19th. He will be discussing the natural and political history of the Harbor Islands in his talk, Home on the Harbor. He will also feature some good tips for visiting the Harbor Islands this summer. So we hope you may be able to join us for one or both of those programs. I think that's the end of the coming attractions. And <coughs> introduce our speaker tonight, who is Anthony Amorin, who is Director of Security and Chief Investigator at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Anthony has been described in the book Art and Crime as among the most innovative and most effective museum security directors in the world. He also heads the museum's own investigation into the infamous 1990 theft of 13 priceless works of art from the Gardner still the largest unsolved art theft in world history. Prior to joining the Gardner Museum, Mr. Amore was an assistant director of the Transportation <coughs> Security Administration, where he helped to rebuild security at Logan Airport after the tragic events of 9-11. He's also a former special agent of the Federal Aviation Administration, where he was the lead agent responding to the Richard Reed shoe bomber attack. Mr. Amore lectures widely on the topic of art theft and provide security analysis for Fox 25 News in Boston. His columns on homeland security issues have appeared in the Boston Herald. He's a graduate of the University of Rhode Island and Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. At the conclusion of his talk, Mr. Murray will be on hand for book signing, and we will have a few refreshments at the back of the room, book signing right here in the front. So please welcome Anthony Murray. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. So, thank you, Jerry. My name is Anthony Amore, as, as stated, and I'm the security director at the Gardner, and uh, also the chief investigator. I love to reinforce that title uh, because I'm also the only investigator at the, <laughs> at the museum, so it makes me feel good about myself. I have to get these small pleasures out of uh, what I do. So um, I do want to talk to you about art theft tonight, and I'm going to talk about the Gardner, but I'm going to talk about art theft uh, just in a bit of a, um, a wider sense. Uh, to, and, and to start off, to give you a sense of where I came to do what I do um, and how I came to write this book, Stealing Rembrandts, I want to give you just a little bit of background. So during the introduction, it was mentioned that I worked um, for uh, the federal government for a, a long time before I started at the Gardner. I was with uh, agencies that are now called Homeland Security Agencies, and they weren't very popular ones. I started uh, my career with the Immigration Service, and um, then I was a special agent with the FAA. That was okay, but then I went after 9-11 when TSA was formed uh, at Logan, and I was assistant director there. And um, I know a lot of people aren't crazy about the TSA. I give a lot of uh, speeches uh, with Howie Carr at my side. His audiences hate when I mention the TSA. But I would remind you, when you think next time you go to an airport and you have to wait in those lines or take off your shoes or what have you, just remember, I, I can vividly recall just after September 11th, and uh, there were, I was following the polls in the, in the media, and the, question, the poll question was, do you think that the United States will be attacked again uh, uh, planes would be hijacked again, et cetera. And 90% plus uh, believed, yes, absolutely, and it'll happen soon. Now we're almost 13 years down the road, and we've been safe from that sort of thing. So there are some benefits to the hassle that you might feel like you experience. So anyway, um, all of my career was spent sort of in counterterrorism type positions. And uh, one Sunday afternoon, I was uh, 
leafing through the Boston Globe, and I happened to be in the classifieds. I wasn't looking for a job, per se, but I was just looking at them, and I saw this very small advertisement for security director at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. It was one of those tiny two or three line ads. And I remember saying, hey, isn't that the museum that had that gigantic theft? And that's how they're advertising for a security director, this little <laughs> tiny <laughs> advertisement. I can still see it in my mind's eye. And um, I'm kind of quirky in this respect. I applied for the job, even though I wasn't necessarily hunting for a new career. And uh, I got an interview. And how many of you have been to the Gardner? I should ask that. How many, who here has not been to the Gardner Museum? That's deplorable. I'm going to have to talk to every one of you. It's unacceptable. I should have brought passes with me tonight. I knew it. So um, we're going to talk about this, though. So uh, those of you who have been know, you go in. I'm going to ruin it for the four of you. But you go in, and you see this amazing courtyard. And it just is mind-blowing. I've been there for eight and a half years now, and I still can't believe that I get to see this place every single day. And it change, you know, the courtyard changes, the flowers and the plants, they change. And that's where the interview took place. And it was hard for me to focus on the person interviewing me because you have this inverted Venetian palazzo, right? It's like our inside joke against the other four who haven't been there, this <laughs> amazing place. So I, uh, I was offered the job, and I wound up taking the job. And um, I thought to myself, well, it's going to be a lot less stressful than working at Logan after 9-11, and this is a whole new world. And, this is great. And I knew part of my responsibility would be to try to fill the empty frames that most of us here have seen in the museum. And um, I remember on my first day going to look at them and saying to myself, my god, this, you know, this is not going to be stress-free. These things need to be filled. We need to get these stolen paintings back. So how to go about it? I, I'm a very data-oriented person, so I, I decided to be very ambitious. I built a database. Um, and, I, and I was going to populate that database with research I, I plan to do on every art theft in the last hundred years. So I said, I have access to the New York Times and the Boston Globe and some European newspapers, and I'm going to search their archives, and I'm going to catalog all these art thefts in order for me to build an MO of who does it and how they're found. So the database was pretty intricate and it had you know, I, everything from day of the week that the theft would happen, what time of day. Uh, were paintings cut from their frames? Were, were disguises used? Was there violence? Were there guns? How much were the paintings worth? Who was the artist? Were there rewards offered? Were they recovered? Where were they recovered? You name it. This really complex database. And I, I dove into the research. And within a couple of hours, I realized I was making a grave error <laughs> by doing this. Because I didn't know, but one of the things I learned that first day is that art theft is an enormous problem. Enormous. It's a six to eight billion dollar per year illicit industry. It's said to be only a third after drugs and guns. That's how often art is stolen, um, uh, traded, used as uh, collateral, looted, um, forged, you name it. It's just a massive problem worldwide with no signs of, of declining. So I said, well, Anthony, that's not going to work. You have, to get a, you have to come up with a new plan. So I thought to myself, all right, 13 pieces taken from the Gardner. Three of them are Rembrandts. Let me look at all the Rembrandt thefts from the last 100 years. That was more manageable. And over the course of a few months, I accumulated all of them. And it turned to be there 81 Rembrandt thefts in the last 100 years. And I collected all that information. And I would file the news articles that I would find and all the police reports, et cetera, into a folder. And I said, you know, someday this would make a good book. And it turns out that it made a great book, <laughs> Stealing Rembrandts, which would be for sale after uh, I finished speaking. So in doing this um, research, I found a lot of really interesting things that have been helpful to me in my, in my work. And what they turn out to be as well is interesting and surprising to audiences that I speak to. One of the first things I learned was that Art theft does not happen in real life the way it happens in the movies. And most people have this perception of a James Bond type scene um, with these really crafty, clever, brilliant, handsome, um, uh, slick thieves who steal art. That's what people imagine. And it comes directly and only from 
the movies. That's where people get their idea, and that makes sense. Now, I know I'm in Foxborough, but how many of you in the audience have had a multi-million dollar painting stolen from your home? <laughs> there must be some in Foxborough, right? You have? No. Is that why you held the door for me before? I had to do it the last time. Oh, okay. So how would you know? I wouldn't know. I've never had one stolen from me, thankfully. So how would you know? You would just know by what you saw and what you'd heard. And that's what everybody believed. So I, I, I found that art theft is not really like one of these action films. It's more like a Coen Brothers film with these really strange characters and bizarre motives and biz even more bizarre outcomes. Another thing I learned, and you can all be very proud of this, I love giving this talk in Massachusetts uh, environment, uh, environments because I found that Massachusetts is one of the top three places for art theft. So there's New York, there's California, and there's Massachusetts. If you are a great artist and your works survive you and they're worth a lot of money and people want them, a hundred years down the road, people put them up in their homes or in their museums. You hope that doesn't happen in Massachusetts because someone is going to steal one of them <laughs> at some point. If you name a great artist, their stuff has been in Massachusetts and it's been stolen in Massachusetts. There's been everything from, of course, Rembrandt, Vermeer, Pollock, Degas, um, uh, uh, Picasso, Gauguin, Manet, and it goes on and on and on. So it's a horrible place for great art. <laughs> except at the Gardner. That's a great place for great art. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the misconceptions. And the final thing I learned that I think you'll find interesting uh, here being in Massachusetts is that what I believe are the three most significant art heists in history happened here in the Commonwealth. So you can be very proud <laughs> of your home state when I go through these. Now, the myth of art theft is what I described earlier. It's these people. <laughs> This is what people picture when they uh, think about art crime. Like, oh, you know, when I tell people what I do after they, they don't believe me at first, you know, because who does what I do? And then they all say, oh, the Thomas Crown Affair. And I say, no, it's nothing like the Thomas Crown Affair. How, how many of you have seen the newer one, the more recent one? With, oh, wow, very few. Interesting. Do you guys watch movies? <laughs> okay. Have you seen Entrapment with uh, Sean Connery and Catherine Zeta-Jones? Yeah. Some of you. Yeah. There's a great scene in that movie, and it really exemplifies how silly art crime is de uh, depicted in movies as opposed to real life. There's a scene where Catherine Zeta-Jones is learning to be an art thief. Sean Connery's showing her their training, and she's crawling in and around these red laser beams, <laughs> blindfolded. <laughs> and one, one of the things I learned in all of this art theft research I've done, because I've been there eight and a half years now. I've gone back and looked at all the art thefts I can find. I'm, I've looked at 1,300 of them now. I can't find one instance where an art thief was blindfolded. So that, <laughs> that doesn't make much sense. The other thing is these red laser beams don't exist. We don't use red laser beams at museums. <laughs> these these uh, grids that you see in movies. As a matter of fact, I just saw um, Ocean's 12 on HBO this weekend. And, and the guy who goes to steal something from a museum, they have these they step it up a bit, these moving laser beams. <laughs> let me just let you in on a secret here as a museum security person. Why in the world would we put visible laser beams that the thieves know to step over? Why would we have, oh, just step here and around this? Why would we do that? It doesn't make sense. They're invisible. And they're not just like this. They cover the whole room. Just, just so you know, in case you were thinking about robbing a museum, <laughs> Skip the, skip the Pilates part where you're stretching and stuff. That's what people picture when they, when they think about art thieves. This is the reality of art theft. These are real art thieves. And uh, these are all uh, connected to Massachusetts. And the first ones I'm going to talk to you about are the two on the left, primarily the guy on the far left. His name is Florian Monday. And he's an art thief. And he's a Massachusetts guy, born in Rhode Island, lived in Massachusetts. He was. Uh, a pretty busy criminal thief in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And he was so interested in thievery that people stopped calling him Florian and they called him Al Monday. Because do you remember the TV show, uh, it, takes, it Takes a Thief? Yes, it Takes a Thief. Ro Robert Wagner played Al Monday. They started calling him Al Monday because he was a thief. And the guy next to him is a guy named David Acquafresca who was one of his cohorts. 
So Al was taking some courses at Assumption College and um, while he was doing criminal activities. And when he was young, his mother would teach him and his brother about art and antiques because she loved them. She did not do it because she wanted him to be a bad guy and, and set his sight on stealing them. So, um, but Al, that's what Al did. He went wayward and uh, set his sights on robbing some art because he knew a bunch of people who could fence stolen goods. A, a, a fence is a person that if you steal something, they can move it for you and you'll get pennies on the dollar. Typically 10% is the standard number you hear. So Al knew a bunch of fences and he got it in his mind, if I can steal millions of dollars worth of art and I can get 10%, that theft is going to really be worth it to me. So where do you get millions of dollars worth of items? Museum. He was right across the street from the Worcester Art Museum and he thought, that's what I'm going to do. So how many of you have been to Worcester? Less. Now, that's a pretty good turnout, though. Uh, so you know Worcester is one of the great museums. It just happens to be in Worcester. But if it was in another, if it was in a, a, a more cosmopolitan city, I'm trying to think of the right kind word, it would be much more famous. And if you haven't gone, you should go. If you haven't been in a while, you should go again because the new, the new director there uh, has just done an amazing job with this museum. It's beautiful. Tremendous. So uh, as a great example of how art thieves think, Al uh, went to the museum and chose four paintings to steal. Now he didn't pick the one that was his favorite like you see in the movies, <laughs> right? His favorite artist is Renoir. He did not choose the Renoir. He decided he was going to steal a Rembrandt, two Gauguin, and a Picasso. Strictly because, like all other art thieves, those were uh, what he thought would be most valuable. That's what art thieves do. They look for the highest value. They're not in it because they want to get a painting that they can uh, give to a man who wants to sit in his basement with his brandy sniffer and look at it and say, aha, it's only for me, like you see in the movies. That doesn't happen in the real world. These paintings are stolen to be sold. And I'll give you other examples of, of, of why people steal this stuff. So he picks these paintings out. He goes to his sister-in-law. And he tells her he needs her to sew these bags, kind of like velvet sort of bags, to put the paintings in when they're stolen. And she says, sure, no problem. Um, I doubt that happens at your Thanksgiving dinner where you <laughs> turn to your sister-in-law for that sort of thing. But she made them. She made these bags for him. Then he chooses a couple of thieves from part of his gang. He had a bunch of guys that did things for him. And uh, he's smarter than the average criminal. And uh, so he had guys that would follow him. And he took these two younger guys and he walked them through and, and they cased the place and looked around, took a look at security so they'd have an idea of what they were dealing with. And in May of 1972, the plan was ready to go. These, these two thieves would go into the museum in broad daylight and rob the place. Now, when I started looking at art theft, that's one of the things that surprised me. Again, I've looked at about 1,300 of them now and I found that just over half of them occur in broad daylight. People always picture that overnight thing. You know, someone breaks through the skylight and rappels in with the black <laughs> costume on. But that's not, more than half of them happen with just sort of like a smash and grab. Guys run into the museum, they pull the paintings they want, and they, and they take off. And that makes sense in some respects, because if you need to break into a place, you could do it at night, but you have to get through all the security and the alarms, or you could walk into the place when it's open and, and go for it from there. So that's what the plan was. That's what Al's plan consisted of. And um, he gets the two young guys that are going to do it. And he gives them both uh, these blue jackets to wear. And um, the reason for that is that would make them, because the place is open at the time, would sort of make them look like employees. They look like they're dressed similarly. And um, the idea was to just take the paintings off the wall right, right there and then and put them in the bags and walk out with them. And it sounds outlandish, but think about it. Most of you have been to, most of you have been to museum, uh, great <laughs> museums. And you know that if you went in and you saw a couple of guys going about their business and calmly taking paintings down and dressed simil similarly, you might not say anything. You might think that's what they do because you've probably never seen that happen. Because we, at museums, you don't move art when people are there. You do it when the museum's closed. So if you saw it, it would be something new to you. And most of the time, the public says nothing. 
when these people steal paintings in the middle of the day. So that's part of the plan. So he gives them the jackets and uh, explains the reasoning to them. Makes sense. Then he gives them both ski masks. Now, ski masks don't look like museum uniform <laughs> paraphernalia, but uh, they're going to wear them and roll them up. And it's May 1972, and you all know Massachusetts in May. What, what is it now? Today was, what, 50-something degrees? You wouldn't fall off your chair if you saw someone walking by with a winter hat on right now, even though it's the middle of May. So they have these masks to pull down to protect their identity if they, if they have to run for it. And um, they're ready to go. He tells the guy that I showed you who was in the center, center, David Aquafresca, to steal a car. And he goes and does that. And he does that like, like you sit here. That's how easy it is for him. Stealing a car is nothing. And Al tells him to steal a station wagon. And, and in 1972, most of you here will remember that station wagons were big. You know, like a beach wagon, you used to call it, with a big way back. Because the Gauguin is big. One of the Gauguins is big. The Brooding Woman is a large painting wouldn't fit comfortably into the back seat of a car. So it made sense. Aquafresca goes out, steals the car, brings it to the guys. They're all ready to go. Al goes over the plane one more time. They're at his house. And they say, OK, where's our gun? And Al says, you don't need, wait, there's no gun in this. What do you need a gun for? <laughs> Gun's not part of the plan. You saw the guards. They're all elderly. They're all very slight of build. They're not going to put up a fight. None of them have guns. No gun. And they argue. And the two thieves decide they're not going to do it without a gun. So finally, Al gives up. He goes into his room. He gets a revolver and gives it to them. And um, they take it. Now they're happy. They're walking out. They look inside the uh, chamber, and it's empty. No bullets. <laughs> so now they have to turn around. They go back to Al. Where's our bullet? The same sort of argument ensues. Al gives up, gives them one bullet. And I, I can see him telling me this story right now. And he says to them, don't shoot anybody. And they say, no problem, of course not. They put the bullet in the gun. Now they just feel like real crooks. And they take off. And they go to the museum. And those of you who have been there recognize this. This is um, this large mosaic near the main entrance. And in 1972, there were no rails up around it. It was just out there. And that's one of the, one of the great mosaics in America. And the Worcester Art Museum has one of the world's best collections of anti mosaics. Definitely worth seeing. So the thieves take off. They come here. They park right near the main entrance. They walk inside, and uh, they know exactly what they're going for. And now as I tell you the story, I told you it's different than the movies. But if you see similarities with movies, point it out to me. So they come in, and they see the, second, the stairs up to the second floor, and they walk right towards them. But as they're getting there, these two younger guys see these two high school seniors, these two females who are there for the day. And they're particularly attractive. So one of the thieves says to them, you might want to sit off to the side. Something big's going to happen, right? <laughs> Strange behavior. Strange behavior. Ski masks are up. So then they walk upstairs, and they do exactly as the plan said, and they take the paintings off the wall without any problem. And they put them in their bags, and they walk out. Nobody says a word to them until they come down the stairs, and they walk right into the center of the mosaic. So now they're on the mosaic, where they're not supposed to be. And uh, these are not cultured guys. They, they didn't think, maybe we shouldn't walk in this. And when they get to the middle, there's a guard at the entrance. And he says to them, stop. And they stop in their tracks. And he says, get off the mosaic. <laughs> so you're halfway across anyway. You've got to keep going. But now he's slowed them down enough. He notices they're carrying these things. And he yells to them to stop again. So now they know they're in trouble. So what do they do? They take the gun and they shoot them. They shoot the guard. They shoot him in the side. And it's a bad wound. And he hits the floor, and he's bleeding profusely. And uh, it's a serious, serious injury. Um, fortunately for him, in a bad situation, he had been giving directions to a visitor who was a nurse. And she gave first aid and saved his life there. But everybody, imagine being at a museum and you hear a gunshot. People scream and everything, and they all swarm. And the two guys just walk out towards the car with their paintings. Now, they take the three smaller paintings, and they put them in the back seat of the station wagon. The driver gets behind the wheel, and his, his accomplice takes the big painting. Remember I told you why they bought a, brought a station wagon? Not bought. They stole a station wagon. And he takes the big one, and he gets in the car and puts it on the roof like this. And he holds it. Just like in the movies, right? Just like George Clooney would do in Oceans, whatever, one of the Oceans movies. 
So the driver hits the gas, the car jerks a bit, the painting falls off. So now he's learned his lesson, you think, right? He picks up the painting and puts it back on the roof. <laughs> but this time they got away. So for all their bumbling and their goofiness and their violence, they committed, at that time, one of the world's biggest art thefts. Successfully pulled it off. But Al was really concerned because now, as he said to me, they put blood on the paintings by shooting the guard. When they shot the guard, they escalated the, the seriousness of this crime substantially. Art theft like this wasn't thought of the way it is nowadays. There's much more emphasis on this type of crime. Back then, the, the penalties weren't as severe. The statute of limitations was shorter. But now with the guard shot, everybody responded. So everyone comes, the Worcester police, state police, FBI are on scene. The two thieves bring the paintings uh, to Al Monday's house. And Al tells me he put the paintings in his drop ceiling. And they took off. They got rid of the getaway car, got their own car, and they went to their favorite bar. They went to their, this local watering hole they went to. It's around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And the place is packed because it's Worcester. And that's <laughs> how it is. So they go into the bar. And um, nobody knows what just happened. They, they just finished this crime. Word hasn't spread yet. The place is kind of bustling. And they're there all the time. Everybody knows them. And um, all of a sudden, on the televisions, there's breaking news. And you know how that like quiets a crowd. And people are waiting. And um, it says, uh, large art theft at the Worcester Art Museum. A guard has been shot. He's in critical condition. He's rushed to the hospital. Worcester police and FBI are on scene. Um, Millions of dollars worth of painting stolen of Rembrandt, Picasso, Gauguin, um, details at six. So holy Toledo, this is international news. And everybody in this bar in Worcester is like, can't believe it. It's in their own neighborhood. This major crime just happened. <clears throat> so the thieves are sitting there, and everyone's buzzing about it. And they do what educated, smart thieves would do at that moment. They say, hey, that was us. <laughs> Now, I, I neglected to mention at the beginning, my book is nonfiction. This is a true story, believe it or not. This really happened. So is, is anybody in the room uh, a, a police officer, a retired police officer, that sort of work? All right, well, I'll tell you, from, I have a long career of investigations and so forth. I will tell you, that's a very good lead. When people, <laughs> when, when guys tell a room full of people they know in public that they just committed a theft, it's a good lead. Yes, sir. Is this the two guys, or is this Al with them? Just the two guys. The two guys went into the museum. So um, not to take any credit away, but the police are on to them. And everyone knows, everyone knows that these guys are connected to Al Monday. And the police also realize these two are not smart enough to have come up with this plan. So they go to Al Monday's house you know, uh, a couple of days later. And it's front page news all over the place, even internationally. This is a big story. And um, they tell Al, we're on to you. And Al tells me that when they came to the door, he wouldn't let them in. But the paintings were above his head in the drop ceiling at that time. Now, Al, I don't know if they were really above his head. They were in the house. He's, he's prone to, uh, he's a colorful, colorful guy. So the police let him know. And uh, they go about doing their business. They know they have to dot I's and cross T's and follow policy and procedure. They can't just rough him up. Um, they have to do what they have to do to get these paintings back. This is a big, high-profile case. So um, Al decides, I have to hide these paintings. I have to get them out of the house. This is the, Rem this is the Rembrandt that was stolen from the Worcester Art Museum. This is uh, Rembrandt's St. Bartholomew. Has anybody, anybody here remember seeing this painting? If you saw the movie American Hustle, this was in it. And, um, Christian Bale's character tells Bradley Cooper's character that that's a fake. It's not a fake. That drives me insane when they said that in the movie, because people believe what they see in the movies. It's not a fake. It's an outstanding example of Rembrandt's work. Um, it's one of these paintings where, you know, if you like Vermeer, you know Vermeer, the way he plays light onto his subject is stunning. You can look at it all day, which makes it funny when you go to the mall and you see, what's that guy? Uh, Kincaid. It's Thomas Kincaid, the master of light. You say, oh, OK. There's there was a couple of others who might be a little better. So Rembrandt's paintings, the, the light comes from the subject in a lot of cases, like in this one. So if you see it in person, you're going to see he kind of glows. 
can't make it out in a slide. This is the best slide you can possibly get. They took it for me. The people at Worcester took this for me and sent it to me, but it's not as good, nowhere near seeing it in person. Now, Rembrandt painted uh, St. Bartholomew three times, and each one of them is kind of the same uh, portrait, you know, this waist level up, um, actually midsection up. But Rembrandt looked, I'm sorry, St. Bartholomew looks drastically different in each of the paintings. But in all three, he's carrying, you can't see it from where you are, but he has a flaying knife in his hand. And the, the reason he has a flaying knife is because St. Bartholomew was skinned alive. The great masters would paint the martyred saints holding or standing by or whatever, um, the instrument of their martyrdom. So he was skinned alive, so he's holding a flaying knife. And I know this really, uh, really well. I know this story well because as a um, young student from grades one to eight, I went to St. Bartholomew's School in Providence. And in the first grade, Sister Martina told us that St. Bartholomew was skinned alive at the stake. And when you're six years old, that's one of those th stories that stays with you for a long time. <laughs> Well, this is a great painting, and you really, really, uh, it's really worth checking out. So now he has to hide it. Al Mundy takes this and the other three, and he takes it to Rhode Island to this place. It's uh, called the Pachillo Pig Farm. And he, <laughs> and he takes the painting and hides it in the hayloft at the pig farm. And this isn't just any pig farm. This is America's first EPA Superfund site. It was the most polluted place in the United States, and that's where he brought these paintings. It's the perfect example of the, the uh, sacred and the profane uh, dichotomy. So now the paintings are there, Al feels they're safe, and he's looking for a buyer, even though all these headlines are out there, he's looking for a buyer for these paintings. He's hoping he can fence them and get some money. He's also hoping he doesn't get arrested. He cannot find a buyer, because Al learns, like all art thieves learn, that when you buy, I'm sorry, when you steal, highly recognizable, very valuable art there are no buyers out there for them. You cannot sell them. There's no one to buy them. So at the same time the police are aware that Al Monday is behind this, there's also the bad guys who know Al and know he's behind this as well. And there's two particularly bad guys, violent guys, who are awaiting sentencing for having violated their um, parole. They did a, a home invasion and violated their parole, so the judge was determining their sentence to send them back. Um, they feel they need to curry some sort of favor with the judge and they're thinking how can we do it they see these headlines and they decide let's get those paintings if we can get the paintings back give them to the judge he'll give us a break so they go to Al's house they get a gun they go to his house they do what the cops can't do he answers the door and they just stick a gun in his ribs and say take us to the paintings and he gets in the car and they drive to the Pachillo pig farm they get the paintings back. These guys give the paintings to the judge. They get a, a little break in their sentencing, and the paintings go back to Worcester. And everybody lives happily ever after. So Al always told me that there were 200 investigators on this case following him. This is, these are the 200 investigators in this picture here. <laughs> these are the FBI and the Worcester police with the paintings after they're recovered. This is the big one that they put on the roof of the car, brooding woman. This is the Rembrandt, and you can see it's out of its frame. Uh, Al felt that the frame was weighing him down, so he threw it in the Blackstone River, so the frame is gone. But uh, the paintings returned, and this is the guard who was shot. So when the painting came back, they had a ceremony, and, and Phil Evans, who took a bullet for the painting, uh, was invited, and he's here. This is a picture of him, you know, stage picture of him looking at the art happily uh, now that it came back. Now, the reason I tell you this story is not just because it really illustrates the fact that these guys are low-level crooks. These are the people who steal art, low-level crooks that work in small gangs. Not just that sometimes they're bumbling, not just that they steal these things not based on some weird uh, collector who wants a certain piece, but money. But it's also the first time in history that art is stolen at gunpoint. It's the first armed robbery of a museum in history. It happened here in Massachusetts, of course. And Al Monday is the father of that uh, particular type of crime. So three years later, after this theft has happened and everything's returned, and um, Al went to, he's in Canada at the time, Al escaped and went up to Montreal and assumed an identity. He told the world his name was Rock Poulin. 
and he was up there doing, in Canada, Montreal, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Eventually gets arrested, comes back to uh, Massachusetts, gets convicted, serves his sentence at the Medfield State Hospital, and helps save somebody's life, and they let him go pretty quickly. So he only served a few years for all of this mayhem, shooting, all the rest. Three years later, another armed robbery of a museum takes place, and it happens in Massachusetts, and it happens at the MFA. I suspect most of you have been to the MFA as well. <laughs> Those of you who haven't been to the garden, have you been to the MFA? <laughs> what a mistake. So <laughs> you have to rectify that. We're waiting for them to return the paint. <laughs> that hurts. <laughs> so again, in May of 1975, so you recognize this view of the MFA. This is where those two baby heads are on the sides of the stairs. I can't make heads or tails of those things, but that's this entrance. And I show you the overhead view because I want you to get it in your mind. It's a good spot if there's no traffic, no Red Sox game, et cetera. Um, if that's your getaway route, if you're parked here at the Circular Drive and you get on the Fenway one way from there, you go to, towards Sturrow, you, you can go any direction. So if you have a 30-second lead on the cops and there's no traffic, they're not going to know where you went because you can go any of the four directions from there. And um, in May, these, uh, this car, I don't know why there were so many guys, but there's four guys in a car and they pull up to this entrance, and um, two guys jump out of the car, and they mean business. They're not um, kind of uh, stumblers like Al Monday's guys. These two, I know who they are, incredibly violent, murderous criminals. And they jump out with um, semi-automatic pistols, not with one bullet. They run into the MFA to the second floor, and they take this painting off the wall, Portrait of a Girl Wearing a Gold Trim Cloak. It's an oil painting on a um, wood panel, an oval panel, slightly bigger than this. They take it off the wall and they run back out of the museum. They went there for that painting, that's what they wanted, it's a very good choice, and they get out of the museum, but just to make sure that no innocent bystanders try to intervene, they fire shots, they fire warning shots in the MFA, if you can believe it to the point where when they're getting towards the car, they, they shoot bullets at the steps. In spite of the fact that they're doing this, and these guys would, would kill, this guy, Mr. Monkowski, the, a guard at the museum, gives chase in the face of gunfire to try to save the painting, which is just an amazing thing. I can't imagine a guard doing that nowadays. I think it's a different generation of people. And he is so determined that he gets to the car and grabs onto this wooden painting and has sort of a tug of war with the thieves. And one of them in the car takes his gun and sticks it to his head and is going to kill him. One of the other guys yells, don't shoot. So he just drills him in the head with the gun. And that's why he's showing his injury here. And finally he lets go. And the thieves have this painting now and they take off, exactly as I said, and they disappear. And what's really uh, interesting about this one is that it's not like Worcester. There's not these guys saying, oh, that was us, and this kind of silly nonsense. These guys are gone, and nobody has the slightest clue what just happened. People who work in the museum, the painting was on loan, the original owner, no idea what, what the heck happened. The police don't know who did it, and there's no word. There's no offer of ransom. There's no insurance request, nothing. It's just gone. Now, this is a really valuable Rembrandt. In the mid-1970s, a team was going around the world called the Rembrandt Research Project, and they formed because at the turn of the last century, there were far more Rembrandts in the United States. Actually, let me rephrase that. There were far more paintings in the United States attributed to Rembrandt than really were painted by Rembrandt. Many, many more. So this, and that was worldwide, too. So this team got together. Uh, the best experts in Rembrandt paintings and decided they were going to go around and examine paintings and say yes, no, or maybe. And when they got to this painting, it was called at the time Portrait of Elizabeth Van Ryn. So it was thought to be Rembrandt's sister. Uh, the team determined this was not Rembrandt's sister. So they changed the title to Portrait of a Girl Wearing a Gold Trim Cloak. Hate that title. I can never remember it. And um, though they found it was falsely attributed in terms of the subject, they also found it's definitely a Rembrandt, and it's as good an example of Rembrandt's work as you're going to find. So good, in fact, that they often use it to compare others to. 
because it's such a great illustration of Rembrandt's paintings. Now, I've known about this theft for a long time, and I had trouble getting information about it. And um, I even had trouble finding this image. Finally got this. was very happy when I had it. I was studying it all the time. It's beautiful, high res. And then a couple of years ago, I gave a, a speech at North Carolina Museum of Fine Art, and this was there, the actual painting. So I said, you have to let me go see it. They took me to the room. I saw it. And when I saw it, it was like seeing a painting I'd never seen before. Absolutely mind-blowingly beautiful. Like, I couldn't believe it. And, believe, and I'm not making this up. Before I worked in a museum, I, I would think that sounds like baloney, <laughs> right? But once you become, uh, I'm, I'm sort of infatuated with these types of works. I like Dutch paintings. When you see them, you just can't believe how great it is. So this is nothing to me now. I mean, to see the real thing is whew, out of this world. So this is gone now just gone. It's an incredibly important Rembrandt painting. In and out, see you later. Now when these thefts happen in museums, one of the things I want you to try to remember is they happen very quickly. It's almost like that smash and grab mentality. These guys were in and out of the museum in a few minutes, max. Three minutes might be an exaggeration. It was very quick. Um, but again, nobody knows where it went. So one of the things I want you to remember about this crime is that this happened in 1975. Okay. That's an important, uh, the time frame is important for this. Some of you, uh, because we're in Massachusetts, might have heard of this guy, Miles Connor. He's a prolific criminal in Massachusetts history. And if you've heard of him, you know he's done everything. He's um, robbed everything. I mean, he's knocked over grocery stores and banks and armored cars and, and um, liquor stores and homes and museums. He's one of the few guys in history that can really be called a professional art thief strictly because he did it more than once. 99.9% .9 of the time people that steal highly valuable art, again, there's no one to give it to, no one to sell it to, so they don't do it again. But Miles did it a couple of times, so he's a professional art thief. In 1973, he and a bunch of guys that worked with him, a handful of guys, went up to the Woolworth estate in Monmouth, Maine. Remember the Woolworth um, uh, department stores? That family's estate is in Maine. And he and these guys went there. They broke into it in the middle of the night. It was empty. And um, they took a bunch of antiques. They took this gra uh, grandfather clock. I think they might have taken some furniture, too. They took a bunch of silver. And Miles saw these four paintings by the Wyatts that he wanted. So he stole them. And they're very, very valuable and highly recognizable. They, have that, they meet that criteria. So they get away with this stuff, and Miles sets about trying to find someone to buy these paintings from him. And there's nobody. He keeps looking. And it's one of the important things I want you to remember. There are no buyers for these things. Um, if you read my book, you'll see there's a chapter called There Is No Doctor No. There is no person who sends out these guys with like a shopping list and says, I want this painting. You need to get me this obscure painting by, you name them, so I can enjoy it all for myself and keep it from the world like in the movies. These things don't really happen in reality. So um, Miles keeps looking, though, because he's a career criminal and it's no big deal to him. Time passes and he can't move the paintings. Uh, then suddenly, because he's had feelers out for a long time, in 1976, Miles gets a word that a guy named Bernie, whose last name I'll leave out, was really interested in getting his hands on some valuable art that he could get cheap. So Miles can't resist and sets up a meeting with Bernie. And he tells him, we'll meet at this grocery store parking lot on the Cape Sunday morning, 6 AM. And he sends word to Bernie, so Miles goes. He's half thinking maybe this guy's not even going to show up. But he does. Both, they're both there. They're both on time. Miles talks to him, gets a lay of the land, decides he's going to take the chance. And he opens his trunk and shows Bernie these paintings, these Wyeth paintings. And um, Bernie can't believe his eyes. And he's taken aback by what he sees. And he tells Miles, this is what I'm looking for. This is exactly the sort of thing I want. And he can't believe it. He's, and he, they talk about a price, and Bernie's fine with the price. Miles is excited because he's finally going to unload these things. 
Bernie reaches into his pocket and he hands Miles his FBI badge <laughs> and, and arrests Miles. And why does he arrest Miles? Why did he have an FBI badge? Because I'm, I keep telling you and I'm hoping you're getting it, there are no buyers for these things. Hmm. So now Miles is in big trouble. So, excuse me, he, he, um, he decides what I'm going to do is I have a lot of contacts. This is Massachusetts after all. <laughs> So he says, I have a lot of political contacts because Miles' dad is a Milton police officer and one of his brothers is a state trooper and another brother is a, is a priest. <laughs> and Miles' and Miles's famous line about this is that I don't know where they all went wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> so using these connections, he, goes to, he gets a meeting with representatives from the Norfolk County um, uh, District Attorney's Office because they're, they're the ones that are going to prosecute him. And he's uh, quickly disappointed because the prosecutor's representatives tell him, listen, Miles, you're in, you're in deep because, believe it or not, well, it's Massachusetts, you'll believe this. He was actually out on bail when all this was happening, on the state charges, right? Because it's Massachusetts. God forbid you lock up somebody, especially in 1976. So he, he's out on bail, and the guy tells him, the state wants you bad, and now you're red-handed with the feds, and both prosecutors want to put you away for a long time. They're seeking consecutive sentences. You're going to be away for a long time, Miles. There's nothing anybody can do for you. Miles pleads his case uh, to no avail. And the guy just keeps telling him, there's nothing we can do. So Miles is dejected. And the legend goes, he, he turns to leave the office. And the prosecutor's uh, representative tells him, you know, this is an art crime. If you can find, I don't know, a stolen Rembrandt or something, maybe we can help you. So Miles just leaves, and he walks out, the door, he shuts the door behind him, and then a light bulb goes off in Miles' head because he remembers, I have a stolen Rembrandt. <laughs> <laughs> just like most of you, right? You would be like, oh, geez, I have one of those. <laughs> I, I almost forgot. So he has to get it now. And as you would imagine, if I asked you all to fill out a, uh, you know, a slip of paper and tell me where you think it would be, a lot of people would say like a Swiss bank or a safe deposit box or you know, uh, um, behind a bookcase where you turn the, the lever and the bookcase turns. <laughs> what he, it was, that's close. What he did was he called his friend Al and told Al, I need the Rembrandt. And Al lives in Quincy, and he said, OK. So he drove to get it. He drove to the North End in Boston, went upstairs to the second floor to his mother's apartment, went in her bedroom, went under the bed, took out the Rembrandt, and brought it to Miles. And that's where it was. It was hidden under his friend's mother's bed, that painting. Right? So it tells you something, though, about stolen art. That's how these things usually get hidden. They're not in some elaborate thing. They're very easy to hide. They're portable. That's why they don't get destroyed very often. They're too easy to hide. Why would you destroy something so valuable? So Miles turned it in. He got his concurrent sentences, didn't serve that much time. He was back in the street creating all kinds of mayhem like he always had. Um, I think it was after that that he was, no, it might have been before he was implicated in the murder of a couple of teenage girls. Um, even just in the last few years, he got arrested stealing cell phones from some drug dealers. He stole a bunch of hay from somebody's farm out in Blackstone. Just can't, can't help himself. But there's a real uh, important reason I tell you the story, and that is that it's the second most significant art theft chronologically because it's the first really um, significant time that high value art, stolen art was used to uh, haggle with prosecutors for a sentence reduction. Very often nowadays, uh, important art is stolen, or art in general, is stolen uh, to be used as sort of a get out of jail free card. So these criminal gangs of guys, not these high level mafioso like you would imagine, but these, these gangs that you, that you would refer to as disorganized crime. Mob associates, these little groups that are selling coke and stealing cars and stealing Oxycontin from pharmacies they know they're going to get arrested because they're so active. That's their full-time job. So they need something to, you know, in their back pocket. So often they'll steal art to try to trade for freedom. Now, I don't want you to think that all of this only happens in Massachusetts. This painting here 
man leaning on a sill, was stolen in 1973 from the Taft House Museum in Cincinnati. Um, great museum. And in 1973, they had a special exhibition of Rembrandt's with this incredibly valuable one uh, taken from the Met and brought to the museum. A, a, a well-known fence in Cincinnati read about this really valuable painting go that's going to be at the Taft House. And he tells a crook he knows, if you steal these things, I can, I can fence them. And this crook has done very low-level crimes. I think one of them was stealing toothpaste and bubble gum from a pharmacy. <laughs> Low-level petty crook, drug user. He says, OK. And he goes and he steals two Rembrandts from the Taft House. He steals the two wrong Rembrandts. He takes the wrong <laughs> ones. This one turns out not even to be a Rembrandt. He stole this one. Man leaning, leaning on a sill is just some other artist. Um, and he gets caught right away. And this is him, Carl Horsley. And I love this. This is a recent thing when I was doing the book, Sales Vice President at Huff Realty. That's the thief. <laughs> so nowadays, that's what Carl does. He's graduated Real Estate Career Institute. And my favorite one here is comments about Carl. It says, Carl was more than I could have expected. And I love that because he, he, cer <laughs> he certainly was. <laughs> this is a painting called Portrait of Jacob de Guy in the Third. Significant piece of art by Rembrandt. Um, it's a companion piece to a uh, painting of Constantine Huygens' brother. Constantine Huygens is sort of like the, he was like a talent scout for the Prince of Orange, and he discovered Rembrandt. And this painting hangs at the Dulwich Picture Gallery in Britain. Has anybody been there? Small little museum with great art. And in 1966, uh, a thief broke in, and he took a number of paintings, two Rembrandts, including that one, a Rubens. All the paintings he took were rather small because what he did was cut a pretty small hole into the employee entrance at the uh, Dulwich Picture Gallery and crawled through, took a bunch of paintings and crawled back out with them. Took paintings that could fit back out the hole and uh, disappeared. And one of the things that comes to me when I heard about that, read about it, as a security person, I said, all right, I can see why he cut the hole and crawled through to get in, but why didn't he just open the door on the way out? Why didn't he take, <laughs> why didn't he take these small paintings and, that he could fit back through the hole? But they called him the rubber bone thief because he was able to get in and out of this little spot. And the way this crime was solved pretty quickly was because the investigator at the time in Britain, mid-60s, used his brain. He didn't use forensic technology and all the things that we would use today. He goes in and he's looking around and he notices the muddy footprints from the thief. And he talks to the facility people and he finds the building is heated from below. Using that, he determines how long that mud had been there by how dry it was. Using that time frame, he set up a perimeter, and that perimeter led to the recovery of the getaway car, which led to the recovery of the paintings. So it's just like this marvelous, it's almost like a Sherlock Holmes type thing, and it happened in Britain, so it's a cool thing to think about. This is a, a picture from the next day, and this is the Dulwich Picture Gallery. That's the hole, and my guess is that's an investigator saying, hey, boss, that's how they got into the museum. <laughs> But, so it's 1966, the painting gets stolen, and um, they get it back, and they get all of them back, and they put them back on the walls. And then a couple of years later, you would think it'd be really, really secure now, a guy comes into the museum in broad daylight, and he takes uh, Jacob Degein off the wall, goes out to his bike, puts it, on the, puts it in his cart on his bike, and he just rides away. <laughs> and the people in the museum can't believe what they just saw. They call the police, the police drive there, and they catch up to the guy on his bike, and it's a scene out of like an old Abbott and Costello movie or something. The <laughs> cops are riding alongside the bike and they pull him over. And they ask him, literally ask him, what are you doing? And he says, I'm just taking it home to sketch it. So <laughs> that, that reminds me as a security person that not just these low level crooks that I have to be on the lookout for, but nut jobs as well. Because you do, you do have crazy people that come to museums and vandalize stuff and, and maybe steal it. So it's stolen twice from the Dulwich Picture Gallery until, I think it was 1983, it was stolen a third time from the same museum by a gang of crooks in Europe. And they did what everyone else tries to do. They tried to sell it. Nobody would buy it. It's too recognizable, too expensive. So they just gave it back. They left it somewhere for the authorities. And then in 1986, stolen a fourth time from the same museum. And a gang tried to sell it, couldn't and gave it back again. 
So now the painting is called, literally called the Takeaway Rembrandt. It's the most, it's the most stolen art, piece of art in history. There's no painting that's been stolen more times than, than that Rembrandt. And I think it, it's probably still there now, but I wouldn't, wouldn't put money on it. This is another British um, art theft. This happened at Chillum Castle in Britain. And the Chillum Castle is, is one of these enormous places like you see in the movies, like just like the beginning of a Harry Potter movie, this giant castle. And around Christmas time, Sir Edmund Davis, who was a big art lover and populated the, the castle with lots of paintings, he um, had two, uh, two or three families staying with him for the holidays and six dogs. And this place was so big that thieves broke in in the middle of the night by smashing windows and they took 19 paintings and they made this much of a mess and no one heard them because it's just a huge castle. So this is the next morning. You can see the frames on the floor and broken here. And um, pretty quickly somebody gave up the thieves. So the police were closing in on them and they panicked and they took this Rembrandt, the one Rembrandt that they stole, Saskia at her toilet, and they burned it. So this painting is gone. Now you remember what I was saying about, you know, just looking at a slide or a picture of a painting is not anywhere near seeing a painting in real life. This one, this is all you'll ever see of this Rembrandt. Hardly, hardly experiencing it at all. It's a dark black and white photo. The director of the Gardner Museum, Ann Hawley, says that when stuff like this happens, it's like if, if Beethoven's fifth was just removed from your memory forever. And you could never, ever hear it again. You could only try to remember what it sounded like, and that would degrade over, over time. So it, it really is a, a horrible thing when these things go missing. In the year 2000, uh, a couple of days before Christmas, in Stockholm, National Museum of Stockholm. Has anybody been to Stockholm? Oh, good, OK. So the National Museum is on a peninsula. And um, it's very busy because there's only one road. It goes along the coast, up and down. And it's the only way in and out of the museum. And uh, thieves had a brilliant idea. So it's rush hour, just before Christmas. Light, fall, uh, light snow is falling. And they steal these two cars put them north of the museum, and they blow up the cars. So now you have all this traffic and all the police and fire responding to these two car fires, so no one can move. Complete gridlock. Just before the museum's closing, just before the doors are going to close, a speedboat pulls up at the museum. Four uh, guys jump out of the speedboat, all dressed in black with submachine guns. They go into the museum, and they get everyone on the floor, and they steal four paintings, including this Rembrandt. And they're in and out in 90 seconds with four masterworks. They get back on the boat, and they're gone. They disappear into the channels. And that sounds like something out of the movies. This is an important Rembrandt painting because it's the only, uh, one of only four paintings he did on copper. So he took a piece of copper, paint a th uh, layer of gold over the copper, then paint the subject. And I've never seen this. This is all I have. Um, it, you can imagine how it must glow in real life because that's the purpose of painting it on copper with the gold and, and again it's a, a really important piece so it's gone now the way that they got it back is uh, the four paintings are missing the police res finally get there they respond they talk to people do you have any descriptions they know they're wearing ski masks they were in and out of here we were on the floor don't even know where they went the people in the museum didn't even know they took off on a speedboat they're just gone and uh, the police start canvassing the area. And there's one guy who was working outside said, I saw them. They were, I saw these guys run towards this boat making a lot of noise. He describes the boat. The police search. They get lucky. They find it right away. They put the boat in the front page of the newspaper. And they get a call immediately. And the guy says, I sold that boat. I just sold it 10 days ago to these thieves, to these guys. And the police say, well, who were they? He says, I don't know. And he said, but here's their cell phone number. And these guys really gave their real cell phone number. <laughs> Instead of just making up a number or what have you, they gave their real number. So the police were able to track the number to a Bulgarian drug gang. Three of the paintings went to Los Angeles in a trade for cocaine, collateral in a trade for cocaine. And then the Rembrandt was recovered in Copenhagen. So what happened was in, in a hotel in Copenhagen, these uh, cocaine dealers, Bulgarian cocaine dealers, uh, find a, a potential buyer from the mafia, this guy named Bob who, who buys art for the mafia. And he goes and meets them in this hotel room. 
and uh, he's looking at the painting and he's looking at it through one of those loops like a jeweler would wear. And he says he needs one more check and he takes his black light and goes into the dark bathroom and checks and he says, this is, this is good. And he yells out to the guys, this is the real thing. Just as he yells it, of course, door gets kicked open and a uh, uh, SWAT team in Denmark comes in and they arrest everybody, recover the painting and the money and everything else. Now, does anybody have any ideas as to how the cops knew to come? It's very disappointing. <laughs> a little clue for you. There's no such thing as an art buyer for the mafia. If you ever meet someone who says, hey, I buy art, I buy art for La Cosa Nostra, you can say, no, you don't. I went to a lecture at the Boyden <laughs> Library. <laughs> If you are a, a bookie or a leg breaker or murderer, there's openings for you in the mafia. But if you are, if you are an art buyer, no openings. No openings. So just try to remember that, OK? <laughs> that guy was really an FBI agent on loan to the police in Denmark, posing as an art buyer for the mafia. If you have any stolen art and someone comes to you and says they're an art buyer for the mafia, by all means, try to sell it to them, please. <laughs> So that leads us back to Massachusetts in the, uh, what I would say is the third in my list of these significant art thefts, which is the Gardner Museum heist. And most of you know about it, but it was March 18. It wasn't St. Patrick's Day. It was the next morning, 1.24 in the morning. Two thieves disguised as police officers approached the employee entrance on Palace Road, the Simmons College side of uh, the museum. And they ring the buzzer, and on the intercom say, Boston police were responding to a uh, disturbance. And the guard buzzed him in. Now, the guard buzzed him in against policy and protocol. He wasn't supposed to. He was supposed to call the police. If you, and this is no big secret, if you're an overnight guard anywhere, the police come and you didn't call them, you call the police and say, did you dispatch somebody? I didn't call them. But he buzzed them in. They came in. And once they did, he committed, the, the guard had committed the biggest faux pas in the history of property protection. Because uh, when Jerry in introduced me, he said it's uh, still one of the biggest unsolved art thefts in America. The Gardner heist is the biggest property theft that has ever been committed in the world at any time. There's never been a bigger property theft than happened in the Fenway in, in, at the Gardner. The paintings are valued in the half billion dollar range. Um, Thirteen are taken. The thieves, uh, when they come in, they, they talk to the guard at first. And they say to him, Do you, is, are you working alone? Is anybody working with you? And um, he says, one other guy. They say, get him down. Here he comes down. When the second guy comes, the thieves say, they tell the kid they were first talking to, you look familiar to us. I think there's a warrant out for you. They put him up against the wall. They tell him they're under arrest, and they handcuff them. Once they're handcuffed, the, the fake cops say, gentlemen, this is a robbery. And they go on to tell them, if you, you know, we're not here to hurt you. If you just follow our orders, you'll be fine. They put duct tape all over them. They cover their eyes and their mouth with duct tape. They bring them into the basement. They separate them. And they handcuffed their handcuffs to pipes. And then they put more duct tape over the cuffs and around their ankles and all of this. Then the thieves make their way upstairs. And they take these 13 pieces. And before they leave, they've been in the museum for 81 minutes. So you remember what I told you about how quickly these art thefts happened. These guys were incredibly comfortable in the museum. So they must have had some measure of inside information. Now, the FBI estimates that around 90% of all museum thefts involve some inside information. But please remember, that doesn't mean every time it's complicit. It just might be somebody said something they, sh they shouldn't have. Loose lips sink ships. So that may have been uh, what happened here. This is the guard who let the thieves into the building. Uh, then this is him the next morning when the police arrive. You can see all the duct tape on him. This, is, this slide always reminds me during my talks, because I forget to say this, I was not the security director in 1990. <laughs> this, um, the haircut, red corduroys are a dead giveaway. It's a no-no. Never would allow that. Blue, maybe, but not the red. That's not the uniform. So this is the guard. Uh, who let them in. Now he, uh, we always protected his identity and his name, and we still don't like to toss it out there, but he, uh, last year, on a CNN special, an Anderson Cooper special, um, told the world who he was. He told his side of the story. Uh, and he, um, 
the first time that happened, I was given a talk and I said, this particular guard exposed himself on national television. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I realized, as I, as I am now, I'm realizing that's not the way to describe it. I should have said he identified himself on national television. <laughs> These are the three Rembrandts we lost in the theft. There are four in the museum. One was taken from the wall and a self-portrait, really important painting, taken down from the wall and leaned against a chair and the thieves didn't take it. It's unclear why they didn't take it. They may have just forgotten it. But they took these three. The top left-hand corner is a small etching, um, uh, self-portrait. And you might know that etchings are something that artists will uh, sort of scrape into a piece of copper. They apply an ink and then they press it onto paper. So there are different iterations of this out there. You might go to a museum and see it. The no, no two are exactly alike, and um, so you might see one in a museum. It's not, it's not ours. Don't be alarmed. If you see it at your friend's house, <laughs> give me a call. This painting here you might recognize, Lady and Gentleman in Black. It's a large Rembrandt painting, uh, double portrait, and uh, that was taken from the wall. That's one of the big empty frames you see when you go to the museum. It's taken from the wall, put in the floor, and the thieves cut it out. So people always talk about paintings being cut out of their frames at the Garda. There were two cut from their frames. That's one of them. And then this is the other. It's even bigger. It's five feet by four feet, and it's called Storm in the Sea of Galilee. It's probably the one you recognize the most. It's incredibly valuable. It's the second most valuable stolen piece of art in the world. It's, uh, one of the reasons it's so valuable is because it's large, and um, it's an important uh, historic or biblical image. Um, Rembrandt painted a self-portrait of himself into it. So there's 12 disciples, Jesus, and Rembrandt <laughs> in the painting. And he's looking out at you. And the way Mrs. Gardner had it was he was looking at his own self-portrait across the room. So they were looking at each other the whole time. And probably the most important reason that it's so highly valuable is because of all of Rembrandt's works. Everything he ever painted, he only painted one known seascape. And this is it. So it was hung on walls in Amsterdam for hundreds of years, painted in 1633. No alarms, no guards, no police, no locks, and it comes to America and it gets stolen. And now for almost a quarter of a century it's been missing. Now that's the second most valuable stolen painting in the world, but this is the first most valuable stolen painting in the world, also stolen that night. That's a painting called The Concert by Johannes Vermeer. And, um, that's the only Vermeer in New England. Vermeer only painted 35 or 36 pieces. There's some debate over how many there were. This is one of his great ones. It's one of his larger ones. It's just an amazing painting. It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, all on its own. Uh, an interesting little thing, if you've been to the MFA, this painting here is called The Procurist by Dirk Van Baberen. And that painting hung in, in Vermeer's mother-in-law's home. So when he would paint, he would see that and he put it in this painting and he put it in one other work as well. And today that painting, the actual painting that was on the wall is at the MFA now. So it's a cool thing that that's across the street and when we get this one back they'll be across the street from each other. Now these two pieces here, this is a Napoleonic finial that was taken, a Chinese beaker which was stolen. Um, these two here and those two are Degas pieces, uh, uh, drawings with watercolor. There are two of these, almost exactly the same. I only put one there, but there's two pieces that are stolen just like that. In the center on the top is a landscape by Govert Flink. When Mrs. Gardner bought that, that was thought to be a Rembrandt. Up until the mid-70s, that Rembrandt Research Project looked at this one and said it's not Rembrandt. It's Govert Flink, one of Rembrandt's students. But it's still incredibly valuable because it's one of the world's great landscape paintings. So that's taken. And the one I always like to leave for last is the top left-hand corner, Chez Tartoni by Edward Manet. And the reason I like to leave this one is because I want you to just imagine that it wasn't 13 paintings stolen that night, it was one. It was just that one. This would still be considered one of the biggest art thefts in history. This would still be considered one of the most valuable missing paintings in the world. But because of the enormity of this theft, it's almost an afterthought, not to us at the Gardner. Every piece is important, but unfortunately to the public. I would venture to guess that almost all of you, if you, went to, if you hadn't been here tonight and you went to some bad guy's house that you know, 
<laughs> and you saw that painting on the wall, you wouldn't say, oh my God, that's that Godner Shea Tertoni, right? You, you probably would say that about Storm in the Sea of Galilee, but not Shea Tertoni. So that's another sad part of this, that a painting like that is missing in some respects by many people, not even recognizable because this is so, such a huge crime. This is a crime scene photo from the next morning. And this is this little frame here is the one that held that little etching. This uh, frame held the Vermeer. This one held that flink landscape. And this is the frame that held Storm in the Sea of Galilee. You see how big it is. And inside here is the stretcher. So when you went to the museum, this is not up on the wall, just the frame. This is a, a close-up of the frame that held Storm in the Sea of Galilee. So just to give you an example of what it looks like, um, this is the frame. This is the stretcher that the canvas was on. This is the floor in the Dutch room. And then this is part of what remains of Storm in the Sea of Galilee. So you can see it's pretty straight cut. It's not these jagged edges that people envision. You know, and I worry that people might somehow see it and think, wow, that's, that's not it because the real one is chopped up a bit. No, it's cut out pretty straight. So before I talk about this last thing here, I just want to emphasize that uh, the Godner paintings come with a reward. It's five million dollars. It's the biggest private reward ever offered. Okay, the, the Bulger reward was a public reward, but that was only two. Ours is five. Okay, what Howie Carr says, that's two and a half whiteies. <laughs> but we are looking to pay this money, and we're very um, uh, earnest about it. I mean, we do want to pay this reward because that means we'll get our paintings back. These, uh, the reward is, is special too because it's not a ransom. We will not pay it to the people who stole the paintings. The reward is merely for information that leads me directly to the art. So if someone told me, listen, I know where the paintings are, here's where they are, or here's who has them, and I went and got them, that person would get the $5 million reward. They don't have to bring me paintings. So um, keep that in mind. And you, <laughs> hopefully you'll keep a, an eagle eye out when you're uh, looking at things. Now, the last one I want to tell you about just harkens towards the future of recovering um, important art. Not long after my book came out, this uh, drawing attributed to Rembrandt called The Judgment was stolen in Marina del Rey. And what happened was it was at an exhibition with about 15 other pieces in a hotel room, uh, a hotel like um, conference room in Marina del Rey. It's a really nice and it's about the size of this room. And it, it, uh, the new, first news report bears all the earmarks of how art theft is described. The, the first news reports were it was professionals who did it. They always say that. And it was a master plan, okay? Here's a masterful plan. There's one curator, all these drawings, Two thieves come in, one of them distracts the curator asking questions about this drawing, while the other one takes the Rembrandt one and walks out. Pretty basic, right? Hardly, you know, hardly um, splitting the atom. So this thing disappears, and the LA County Sheriff's Department's in charge of recovering it. They're, they have the jurisdiction. They have this guy that works there, his name's Captain Mike Parker. And he's a, he's a maven of social media. He knows everything. I just know Facebook and Twitter. This guy knows every platform. And he blasts the image out because he knows if you make it highly recognizable and let the world know it's valuable, no one's going to be able to sell it. At the same time, now it's all over the internet. Within like a half a day, there were hundreds of thousands of hits for this image. You couldn't miss it. If you did a Google search, it was all over the place. He got it on all the newscasts. So, the media sees, hey, we have a stolen Rembrandt. Let's call this guy who wrote Stealing Rembrandts. So I, before I respond to them, I call Mike Parker at LA County. And um, we coordinate a message. So in all of my interviews, I said the same thing to the media. I have a message for the thieves. If you have the drawing, you've not stolen a picture. You've stolen a problem. You need to give it back. Leave it somewhere. And one of them, I said, leave it in the church. If you uh, and do it and call the authorities and just hope the whole thing goes away because you're not going to get any money off it, you can only get in trouble. And three day, within three days, the painting was left at a church in Marina del Rey, and this is the recovery of it here. And um, in typical Los Angeles fashion, the spokesman for the LA County Sheriff's is James Arness's son coming out here. 
to uh, make the announcement. But I think that's where the future of, of um, recovering art that's highly valuable and highly recognizable lays. And I want you to remember that's what this, I'm tr that's the type of art I'm talking about tonight. Every day, paintings worth $10,000 or less or $20,000 get stolen. In, uh, so not an artist that's on the tip of your tongue and those get fenced and it happens constantly. But when we're talking about masterpieces from museums like we're talking about tonight, there are no buyers. Um, the stuff is either recovered right away because somebody talks or a generation passes before it's recovered. But there's a decent recovery rate. It's kind of nebulous to put a number on it because sometimes it's not reported. But the stuff does get recovered. So we're a generation after our loss at the Gardner. Um, and I'm very, very confident that all of you will see the Gardner uh, 13 pieces again. So even those of you who haven't been there, <laughs> that'll be your chance. That'll be the opportunity for you to come. But um, I'm willing to answer any questions that you have. But I just want to, do want to thank you very, very much for coming tonight to hear me talk. The other thing I want you to remember, it's very important to me that my book is for sale afterwards. <laughs> You're back. And, um, but seriously, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thanks. Yes, sir. Given that our, there's, no, there's no guy sitting in his basement staring at those 13, mm -hmm. what, was that um, robbery planned for those particular uh, pieces or for that room? My belief it, or, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Is, it, is, this, uh, do you, is, is there a theory that this is um, the exception to the rule and that somebody has No, no. I, my um, belief is that, you know, uh, every major, the reason Rembrandt's the most often stolen great master per, per capita, per work, there's more Picasso stolen, but per piece of work it's Rembrandt. And Rembrandt, everyone knows who he is, everyone knows it's highly recognizable, and they're in every major city. But think about what I told you tonight. What, who has them in Massachusetts? Worcester? MFA and Godner. Worcester got hit, MFA got hit, and in some respects it might have been, just been the Godner's turn. And if there's a shopping list, it's somebody telling his thieves, his guys, Rembrandt. And that's why they, when they went to the Godner, they went directly to the Dutch room, they went right for the Rembrandts, and then they took other things that make no sense. I mean, they make sense to me, I can't talk about why, but if you, at first glance they make no sense. Um, so, they went to steal Rembrandts because they're valuable. And they might probably stole them as get out of jail free cards. They might have stolen them because of the value as well, but that's where it, therein is where it lays. But it's not some collector. No way. Yes, sir. Hasn't there been talk in recent years about uh, Miles Connor and he's been offering uh, to, to give up some information that he knows where these are? And, and I remember that I hadn't thought about it, but until you mentioned uses get out of jail free cards, it seems that you know, he's done interviews talking about that. Miles Connor has talked about the Godner heist. He's often said that it was his brainchild. He's talked about being able to provide the paintings for certain types of immunity and all of the stuff. What it's, and that's been going on since 1997. What that's amounted to is nothing. Absolutely nothing. Miles was in jail when the theft happened. Um, he said that he believes these two individuals, he gave their names, stole it. I think it's incredibly unlikely that they were the thieves. Um, you know, could Miles have information? Yes. Does he have information that's useful to us? I don't believe so. Yes, ma'am. Do you believe all the works are together or do you think they've been dispersed? The, the Godner ones? Uh, the question was, do I think that all the Godner works are together or are they dispersed? My belief is that they're together or they're separated amongst a group of confederates, uh, which complicates matters because now you need more than one person to, to say, okay, I'll, I think it's time to give them back. But I don't think they're, you know, I don't think there's one here and then one, I don't think anybody has one that they don't realize what they have. I don't think it's that scenario. Yes, sir. I, I read somewhere that uh, one of the theories of many um, was that Whitey Baldwin was connected in the IRA, that it was somehow going to be used as collateral for some gun money to, to the IRA. Mm -hmm. Is that still out there as a possible theory? 
That is widely uh, circulated theory. That's, uh, uh, that's an, uh, one of the first theories that we ever discounted. There's absolutely no, I don't know, I don't know why. I, th I think people put everything with Whitey. Um, <laughs> Whitey did, Whitey, like I keep mentioning Howie, but Howie Carroll always mentions, Whitey was too lazy to go get duct tape and do these different things, but, but. Um, <laughs> he wasn't, but that he was somehow, as he had his finger on the pulse yep. of anything criminal. <laughs> No, I know. I'm just joking. He, but no, he didn't. And, and one of the key things to keep in mind when people talk about Whitey, I was so relieved when he finally was caught um, because people stopped calling us about Whitey. You know, the prosecutor for the Gardner case at the time is the guy who put Whitey away, Brian Kelly. Um, he, he, he's a local in this, not in Foxborough, but he, we knew. And one of the things we always knew is all of his guys had been questioned. They had all testified. They had all um, admitted to 19 or 20 murders. And there's no way that any of them was going to say, yes, I killed this woman, I buried this one, I strangled that one. Don't ask me about that Degas, though, because that, <laughs> that's out of bounds. So we never believed that. And there's never been a reason to believe the IRA. That's this fanciful theory that's come out of some Scotland Yard types. But no reason to think it was anything but locals. Yes, sir. But you mentioned that uh, it's hogwash that some big time art collector will order, the, order that. I've read, and I read it on the FBI um, fine art data, you know, stolen databases and mm -hmm. stories. I've read that that had happened in Europe where American collectors had ordered uh, European masters stolen. You know, and they got caught in the process or copied. Cut, like for, for, uh, forgeries, you I mean? I was Caravaggio was born, and, uh, but you're saying that that. So I no, there was a, there was a case where um, uh, I, I think you might be thinking about a case where these uh, Italian mobsters in That's Italy, that happened in in, church. in Italy. Yeah, they they took this. But you have to remember that thefts from churches in Italy are. That's what ha I mean. They have hundreds of art theft investigators in Italy because the churches get ransacked. It wasn't, for, a, it wasn't an American collector that had ordered it. Or no, it I, a I, thing, I, no I believe it was an Italian. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but if you, even if you think statistically, the number of times when you think about all the art that's stolen, the number of times that it's ever been, you know, some billionaire dies or someone, you know, you have to remember, we always say wives become ex-wives, girlfriends become ex-girlfriends, children become um, estranged. Um, there's never been a case where someone said, well, he has these things and they go in and, oh my God, look what's in his his underground lair. This case with this guy Cornelius Gerlitt that died last week, he, those were Nazi looted art and that's a whole different ball game, a whole sick sordid affair. But in terms of going out and stealing these masterpieces on order, on order sometimes uh, uh, there'll be a Colombian drug gang that will take, but they don't come to America steal this painting and you know to hide it away. It's always much more complicated than that. Yes? So when was it like not possible to track it down by who bought a ton of duct tape like the week before? That's such a great question. The que <laughs> that's a great question. The question was, is it not possible to, to try to track it down by the type of duct tape to see if it was bought somewhere before? And that's a great thought. Um, it's not even clear. that they, 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 they looked at the type of duct tape. They have a duct tape database. <laughs> they really do because duct tape is used so often. And it tells you a lot of things. For instance, you know the guards, uh, the thieves didn't have gloves on because you can't operate duct tape if you're wearing gloves, right? <laughs> and they, the guys that do bank robbery cases, they'll tell you they find a lot of times at the scene rubber gloves all tied up in duct tape on the floor because <laughs> it doesn't work. But they did look into that. And um, uh, 1990 wasn't that, to you it was, but it's not that long ago. And um, uh, not, I think now would be an easier thing to track. They weren't even sure back then if the duct tape had, had been in the museum already because there's a lot of uh, maintenance people in the museum and repair people that do different things. So it wasn't even clear where that role came from. But that's a great thought. That's really, you should go into that line of work. It's a, <laughs> it's a very, very smart way to think. Yes, ma'am. You had talked about the, I think it was the Rembrandt that was burned in that one case. How frequently are these stolen artworks damaged or destroyed? That's another great question. That I should have mentioned. The reason I point out the, the Rembrandt that was burned is that of all the 81 thefts, that's the only one that was destroyed. And the people that repair paintings are magicians, and they would be mad if I said that in front of them. They're magicians. They, 
one of the paintings that was stolen, you can read all about it in my book, was a um, portrait of a rabbi attributed to Rembrandt. And it was held for almost 30 years and returned anonymously because you couldn't sell it. And when it was returned, it had been stored so poorly that mold grew be between the paint and the canvas. So the de Young Museum got it back and they put it on exhibition in that state to show people what happens. And then they repaired it. And then after it was repaired, like, it, like brand new, they, they found out during the repairs, this isn't even a Rembrandt. And yeah. it's in storage somewhere. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you know anything about the Gilbert Stewart um, uh, robberies down at the Sentinel? Since you have some amount of time. Had you ever researched the Gilbert Stewart thefts? Do you know anything about those? The one, uh, I know the, uh, his daughter, the Mary Stewart uh, painting that was stolen in Cambridge from the Longfellow house, but I don't know about the Gilbert Stewart. No, the Gilbert Stewart house had been robbed, too, and they would come in while people were In Rhode Island? Tour. Yep, they would come in while people would, were on tour, and the thieves would just steal the art right off the wall. Are you from Rhode Island? Yes. I am, too, because I, I, I went there as a kid. Yeah, <laughs> I went and there as a kid, and I remember hearing that sort of, and as a kid, you're just sort of shocked. Like, someone would just walk in, and broad daylight with all people, and they would just run in, and, you know, the, the museum staff wasn't going to put up a fight, so Maybe he's it's priceless. I don't know if it's priceless. Well, see, that's interesting because the, my understanding is that all of the paintings at the Gilbert Stewart House are reproductions. So maybe that's why I haven't heard about it. They might have come in, come in and install these reproductions because, like, if you go to the MFA, they have you know, Gilbert Stewart's The Real Painting of John Adams is there, too. But I'd love to find out. That's the first museum I ever went to. I would love to get involved in looking for them. He catalogs his paintings. Oh, they are? Right, so that'd be an easy way to account for them. Yeah, Gilbert Stewart's great. It's a real similarity between his and, and Dutch paintings, you can see in, in that. The ones that were still there were great. The eyes would follow you wherever you went in the room. Yep. Yeah, I love that. I remember seeing that as a kid, and that was really creepy, but that was <laughs> awesome paintings. Is that it? Oh, one more. How come the guards couldn't give a description of the men who The guards did give descriptions of the thieves, and um, last year on the anniversary, the FBI the U.S. Attorney and I had a press conference and we announced we know who the thieves are. And we do. We, we're, not, we're not releasing their names. The thieves, knowing who the thieves are, has not led us to the paintings. Mm -hmm. um, but it does help us cut to the, cut to the chase when we get new leads. Um, and people say, why did it take you 23 years? Here's why. The guards gave, two guards gave their descriptions, right? First of all, they couldn't agree on which one had a fake mustache on. Did they both have a fake mustache? <laughs> who had glasses? But here's the bigger problem, right? So the description was this, two white males, nondescript accents, um, medium height, medium build. Uh, one had a round face, dark hair. The other had a, a narrower face with dark hair. Go get them. <laughs> That's it. And those composite drawings that I showed earlier, uh, the guards said those weren't really that great. But I have to tell you, we used to get so many calls from people and it was always uh, we'd always get these calls from women saying it was their brother it looks like my brother-in-law it looks like my brother-in-law and, it, and <coughs> it was always the brother-in-law I always wonder, what, what is this thing with brother-in-laws you know but but uh, that's what that's what made it incredibly hard yeah. yes ma'am how about the alarm system I always thought all those paintings were had an alarm who told you that <laughs> no, no, most paintings are, I'm, I'm not talking about the Godwin, I'm talking in general. They, they don't necessarily all have an alarm, but if they do, the alarms are local, so the alarm would only go off in the museum, you know. There were, no, I mean, there are, there are alarms that went off in the museum that night on the computer and stuff, but think about all the businesses and museums and schools and property in Massachusetts, and imagine if every alarm went to the police station. There would just be a constant buzz. Right, so that doesn't really happen in real life. So there were alarms that went off. The guard never hit the duress button, which would have went straight to the police. So we do know how they moved about the museum because we have a record of their motion detector alarms. So that's been useful. Yes, ma'am. Just had a quick question about um, what you were saying about if someone noticed a painting. I'm wondering sort of how many paintings are maybe hung and someone would say, oh, that looks like, and you know, oh, no, that's just a total copy. Like that there may be copies of ours or, or the real thing but has been you know passed off no we check them the no we check you know it's <laughs> another no, 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 but meaning that like so then you wouldn't say this so if it's hanging in my living room uh -huh. it's not 
<laughs> so, and you came over, and you saw it, and you say, oh, that looks like that painting. And I say, no, that was a knockoff that we got on our honeymoon in Paris mm -hmm. of this painting. Mm -hmm. But what if it was the real, I mean, this is Well, then if you, hopefully you would call me, because that happens. <laughs> she, I don't think she would have. Oh. I had a plausible story where oh. I said, I got this off the street. This young artist made a copy in Paris, and I hung it. Oh, well, I mean, that's a problem with anything. Like, You're right. So right. like I, I sometimes worry about, and then as, as you're saying with the generations, you know, we're getting less and less connected to art. Yep. I mean, I'm not sure I could tell you the features of some of the major artists anymore. I mm -hmm. could in college, but now my kids certainly can't. In 20 years, they may not. And unless you see it digitally, I think that we're getting further and further away from seeing Well, art. we, we uh, a couple of things. First of all, I, get, I do get a lot of calls of people that saw things like that. We check every one of them. Secondly, I we, don't have it. I believe that. And secondly, I, yeah, you never know. Why should I believe you? But secondly, it's actually in my secret lair. Be careful. I'll check. Secondly, um, um, that threw me off. Your secret lair threw me off. But um, I would say, to be honest with you, we've worked really hard to get the images out there. We had uh, a couple of years ago, we and the FBI had billboards all over the area. We did that again last year. Um, we have the FBI uh, put a lot of money last year into a major website on their site. It's a whole microsite on the FBI.gov um, about the theft. Um, you know, but that's the, you bring that up, and it's funny because in my apartment I have versions of these paintings all over the place. I just I, I eat, sleep, and drink it, and um, I'm on the first floor. And I'm always thinking, you know, what if my shades move a little and someone sees this, I have a giant <laughs> copy of Lady and Gentleman in Black. And I'm just like, I wonder if someday someone will call on me. That would be great. It would make me feel people like people are paying attention. <laughs> but I would, the last thing I'll tell you is that I do believe that if, if you went over her house, something about the painting would stick out to you because they're that good, you know. You would not say this is from... <laughs> Uh, Bed Bath and Beyond, or wherever those places are. <laughs> home Goods. This wasn't, yeah, this wasn't off the shelf at Home Goods. We just have dogs playing poker. <laughs> <laughs> On velvet, yeah. It's sort of theft where every once in a while you hear of a verified masterwork like coming out of somebody's attic when yeah. someone dies and it's been missing for like 80 years. Yeah. They don't even know how it got in the attic. Mm -hmm. and, hmm. They usually do know, they usually are able to tell how it got in the attic. A lot of times well, the story is just hidden. You find something and they're divesting an estate and they're like, you know, what's this? Mm -hmm. That's rare for masterpieces, masterworks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes like lesser known paintings, like things like that, but not for masterpieces. They, a list of these attics? On the, I know. <laughs> I've been to a lot of them. It's gross. But on the 10th, on May 10th, uh, the, um, tax investigators in, in Paris found, a, just a couple of days ago, found a Van Gogh in a, a, a safe deposit box. And then, yeah, that with a master, a work by a master. It may not yeah. be the most famous thing, but you just, I mean, to me, that's incredible that someone could have that in their aunt's attic and not have noticed it. Or. Right, yeah, well, there's always, believe me, when, the, when these things get re returned, you have to really dig deep into the story about how they came back. A lot of times it's a cover story hmm. because the deal is if we can just get it back, we'll make this go away. Yes, sir? Just not on paintings, but on you. Mm -hmm. Coming mm -hmm. from your background. Yeah. And, <laughs> serendipity this three-line ad how much art training have you had since you got this job it's all um, on my own um, but like I, I have access to the best and the brightest mm. you know they're always eager to talk to me and eager to help I mean I, I do know I do believe I know almost everything there is to know about these 13 huh. everything and um, and I wrote, then I wrote this book, so I learned a lot about these other ones. And now my second book I'm writing right now is about art scams, like these different people who do these scams, con artists that do things with art. So, you know, you just self-educate. But once you get, if anybody here is an art lover or, go, or worked at a museum, once you get the bug, it's, you're, you're done. You never stop loving, like for me, Dutch art. So I, I, get, I, I look at everything I get my hands on. Yes, ma'am. Is it thought that these 13 pieces are somewhere local, like in the Northeast? I believe so, yeah. Not most of the time when art is stolen in anywhere, in any country, when it's stolen, um, it stays pretty local. There's no reason to transport it far. 
<laughs> Foxborough is just as likely as any other place. <laughs> so keep, keep your eyes open. Thank you, folks. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, he says, first person to look at is contractors. Yeah. Well, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yep. But you let these people shoot me an email. Where do you where do you do art? Oh, perfect. Uh -huh.